Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be here. And thank you very much uh, to the organizers for inviting me to moderate uh, the next plenary session titled Climate Change, Conflict, Cultural Heritage Pr Protection. So what brings our speakers together is a shared understanding around the importance uh, of the protection of cultural heritage. Today, however, we are gathered to reflect on the challenges created by climate change and conflict. So together, they complicate, if not impede, efforts to protect cultural heritage. The International Committee of the Red Cross reported that over 20 countries are most vulnerable to extreme weather events, many of which are in conflict, leaving cultural heritage wide open to their fury. Climate change, some may argue that there's a correlation between it and conflict, that it is an aggravator. It is a force multiplier. I would like to start by getting to know our panelists today, understand their place in the cultural heritage protection ecosystem, then delve deeper to unpack the degree to which conflict and climate change impacts cultural heritage and try to tease out realities around this issue as well as possible solutions to help mitigate the problem. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome the speakers to the stage. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you all for being here. It's great to have you all here. And thank you all for our fantastic audience as well, uh, taking part in today's uh, plenary session. So I'd like to um, just briefly introduce yourselves and tell us a bit about your work and your relationship with Elif. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, my name is Francesco Bandari. I'm a former UNESCO officer. I was the head of the World Heritage Center and then head of culture at UNESCO until 2018. Now I'm a freelance retiree, working, <laughs> working a lot though, and my retirement is very full of activities, especially in this region and with many other partners. And I'm, uh, I continue you know, working, doing things. I'm also a member of the Smithsonian uh, Cultural Heritage uh, Institute, uh, so I'm, you know, I'm trying to uh, give back what I have learned in my profession. Sure. Now, I'm sure there's a lot that you are bringing to the table here, and all these uh, kind of roles you've had. So, um, um, how, how how do you um, you're, you're looking at your relationship with Elif, perhaps, and what Elif has been? We've heard a lot earlier about what it is. It's about its agility, about its collaborative ethos, about its flexibility. Could you perhaps uh, well, tell us more about I that? Think, <coughs> first of all, I witnessed uh, the birth. I was, uh, Alif, I was here when uh, Alif was uh, launched in 2016. So uh, from, from the start, I've, I've uh, really uh, supported this idea because uh, I think you know, what we've seen in the past uh, decades, a uh, couple of decades, you know, is really this intensification of uh, attacks to cultural heritage. Cultural heritage has become uh, an object of uh, war in a way. Then they said weaponized, but in a way, it's been more a, a victim than, yeah. than of, of, of wars. Um, this has happened in the past, or also we know that. Uh, just uh, I don't have to remember World War Two or, or World War One or other conflicts, but certainly in our uh, life experience, this has been um, a big acceleration. So, as 
disasters and, uh, and, and uh, destruction accelerates, also response has to accelerate. So I saw Alif as an acceleration of the response of the international community to this very, very serious problem. And the results are there. I think in six years alone, we've seen a, you know, a very big response. Of course, we know that there is a lot more that needs to be done, and that's why we're here to discuss it. Thank you very much. So. Thanks, Bob. Hello. Uh, I'm still chuckling at Francesco introducing himself as freelance retiree. <laughs> uh, my name is Andrew Potts, and I'm the coordinator of the Climate Heritage Network, the CHN. CHN is an international network of organizations that believe in culture-based climate action and its power to help people imagine and realize low-carbon, just, climate-resilient futures. And I think it's the first time the CHN mm -hmm. has appeared at an ALIF event. Uh, I, I think the opportunity come, and thank you for the opportunity, I think it comes from some joint work that we did last summer in Naples at the mm -hmm. uh, meeting of ministers of culture of the Mediterranean region. And if you look at the outcome document uh, from Naples, there's some very good uh, innovative language there about the role of culture in peace and stability and security, but then linking that to climate action and to sustainable development and also to inclusive processes. And so that document is, I think, uh, a nice testament to what happens when you start to curate this culture and conflict and climate conversation. And, and just to say one more thing about it, uh, that language lived on because um, a few months later was the UN climate conference in Egypt, another Mediterranean country. Mm. And we and other partners took some of that language from Naples to Sharm el-Sheikh and succeeded in getting culture embedded in some of the decisions taken uh, at COP27 in the cover decision, the first time the word cultural heritage ever appeared in a COP cover decision, and also in the new framework to develop a global goal on adaptation. Uh, we didn't get comprehensive uh, treatment of culture by the UN Climate Agency. That will have to wait for Dubai in December and COP28. Yes. But it really showed a hunger and a need for uh, work at this intersection of culture and climate, exactly the kind of conversation that we're having just now. I think a lot can be said here about these multilateral organizations or platforms, such as COP, for example, where perhaps it can invite and allow um, such conversations to be, to be held. And um, maybe you can talk later and look at if there's any uh, change since COP27, looking ahead towards you know, uh, this year's COP28 here in the UAE. Yeah, of course, thank you. All right, sir. Donc, mon nom est Thierry Geoffroy, je suis architecte de, de formation. Euh, je travaille dans le domaine... Thierry uh, Geoffroy, uh, scientific director. I work with uh, UNESCO since uh, 1980s, uh, so more than 30 years of experience in this sector. Maybe I am not anymore much uh, in the field uh, since I work in the lab of research at the School of Architecture, but I still uh, specialize in uh, this uh, uh, this domain, but my relationships uh, with uh, Alif as uh, an international export, expert uh, since 2012, uh, I worked on the protection uh, of uh, this uh, small document that you have produced for the army as a counter attack, attack. and uh, s from 2013 to 2016, uh, work has been done in the reconstruction with my colleagues here, Sidi Bey, Ulay Dokulabi, that also took part in this uh, work. So I was invited to take part in the initiative of launching uh, Alif. Uh, we have seen uh, this experience uh, that uh, happened uh, and uh, this work uh, also we've had uh, at UNESCO Mali, we continued. I participated in uh, the formation of the document that was submitted for GAO. And also I uh, took part in the expert mission. 
So these are some new things that we've been discussing today, and we want to maybe uh, have a, a more broader research on it. We want to use all the works uh, to enter into deep uh, study and uh, reconstitute them. Obviously, uh, working on the ground in a sense, that's where you bring that research and knowledge to the table to policymakers and other decision makers. Alors, la, la, la grande la grande the speciality of Crater is the work and the field. When we say action, 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 I think it has always been the nature of the organization in which I work. And uh, it has a, a double mission, uh, an association. Uh, 19, since 1901 that works on this field. So it's nice to have double and en a double entity and uh, have real work in the field uh, to be uh, uh, enshrined uh, in the field and uh, teach it as a teaching material and at, at the academic level. So it's a nice thing to do. Uh, my name is Melissa Grunland. I'm a journalist and I cover cultural heritage. Um, I covered the first conference in the Emirates Palace. Um, I think I've interviewed many of you in the audience, some of you many times. Um, and one of the things I found when I was reporting on cultural heritage is that conflict generates headlines, but often people were saying our biggest problem is not conflict or not post-conflict reconstruction, but actually climate change and these kind of inexorable daily unstoppable um, degradations of, of um, salinity or desertification or the many other ways that climate change is impacting on cultural heritage. And um, one of the great things of working with Aleph as a journalist is that you can say, I'm working with Aleph. You know, they're not, um, I'm not trying to get information from them. They're really collaborative, even for people like journalists who are sometimes perceived as being on the other side, you know, you know adversarial in a sense. So I, I called Sandra and I said, you know, I keep hearing this, I keep hearing cultural um, and climate change is impacting on cultural heritage. Who are you working with? Are you hearing this? What projects are you working in this environment? And she sent me a list immediately of people that she had been speaking to about it, different projects where that had been um, a small concern, but they, they were also hearing that it was a larger concern. So um, I put together a huge body of research and it's, it's a subject that I'm continuing to cover, but. But in terms of uh, the relation to Aleph, you know, that, that is one of the great things, even from the journalist side, that, that they're so responsive and, and collaborative. Well, thank you for that, Melissa. And, and maybe uh, you can tell us something about the, um, maybe the role of media in general and, uh, when it comes to uh, looking at, observing, you know, recording, reporting on, but kind of highlighting uh, the challenges that cultural heritage uh, face these days? Well, I mean, how long do you have? <laughs> uh, the role of media is very tricky because, um, you know, there aren't many places that will give sustained coverage to cultural heritage. I think that a lot of it is headline driven or press release driven. You know, there's there's been a new, um, you know, like uh, the drying marshes in Iraq have uncovered a new temple complex. But actually, what you really need are sustained um, publications that support sustained inquiries by journalists who can know the field, know, can see new things that are coming in, can synthesize different problems. And so I think, um, you know, media is perpetually in crisis. My whole career media has been in crisis. But I think in terms of cultural heritage, this crisis is really problematic because you really lack um, a lot of specialists who are able to kind of synthesize the material um, and all the amazing work that all, you're all you guys are doing. Yeah, thank you. We have um, um, one other panelist who will not be joining us here in person, but has prepared a video for us. His name is um, uh, Mr. Mohammed, Mohammed Omar. He's the founder of Mosul uh, Eye in Iraq. And do forgive us if the video is a little bit um, um, not in its best shape, um, but, but hopefully the, the substance um, um, goes further than uh, the recording itself. Thank you. Distinguished guests, dear Ali Forum organizers, 
Thank you for giving me the chance to speak at this forum today. I want to talk to you about the impact of climate change on cultural heritage and how Alif can work to safeguard the climate impact impacted heritage. Cultural heritage sites and artifacts are unique and irreplaceable windows into the past. They are our connection with our uh, people. They are the reminder of the civilization that humans can achieve. But the recent climate change is posing, the recent climate change factors are raising high and significant risk to the cultural heritage. The destruction of cultural heritage is immense and the rising sea levels, the increased temperatures and extreme weather events are just a few examples of how climate change affects our cultural heritage. But add to that the drought in many areas in the Middle East. But we have also witnessed extreme impact of climate change on cultural heritage like what happened in the city of Venice, which is facing a great threat, immense threat that it will be sinking due to the rising level of the sea. Another example is the destruction of the indigenous heritage in Australia caused by wild, wildfires. So what can Alif do to safeguard climate change impacted heritage? The foundation can work with communities and governments to develop and implement strategies to mitigate the effects of climate change on cultural heritage. This can include protecting cultural heritage from flooding and erosion, developing sustainable tourism strategies and working with indigenous people to preserve their cultural heritage. We can also work to raise awareness about the importance of cultural heritage and the impact of climate change on these resources. This can be done through public education campaign, workshops and conferences by raising, our, raising awareness of these issues. The foundation can help mobilize support for protecting and preserving cultural heritage. In addition, Alif can work to provide funding for research into new technologies and approaches to preservation for the preservation of cultural heritage in the face of climate change. For example, research into new materials and construction techniques could help to develop a more resilient and sustainable infrastructure for cultural heritage. Finally, Alif can work to develop partnerships with organizations and stakeholders to achieve common goals. By working together, we can leverage our collective resources and expertise to achieve a more significant impact in protecting and preserving our cultural heritage. Together, we can ensure that our culture continue to be a source of pride and inspiration for future generations. Thanks. Thank you for that. Uh, Mohammed did talk about the current situation as well as put forward a few ideas of how uh, particularly Elif um, can um, help um, in terms of protecting cultural heritage. Uh, we're gonna, we will talk about that later, perhaps towards the end of our uh, discussion today, some of your ideas and thoughts from your experience. But for now, let's look at the landscape, go a little bit deeper. Uh, Francesco, um, could you unpack the landscape today? And I think let's use that six year time frame, because yeah. I know we could go back a century. Um, but and, and why six years? Yes, it's the inception of Elif, but also the region has gone through a lot of changes in terms of taking leadership on many issues. Um, so let's use that time frame. Thank you. Well, you know, you <clears throat> let's talk about things that are very complex. Uh, climate change is complex. Conflict are complex. Mm -hmm. You put them together, mm -hmm. they're complex square. <laughs> it's really difficult. But <clears throat> at the same time, let's also um, see that this is not a new issue. Uh, this is a relationship between climate change and conflict has accompanied the history of humanity since the beginning. You know that today historians and paleo historians understand that the extinction of Neanderthals was, you know, a, a product of climate change because of the glaciation, the ice, the, the ice age, the Homo sapiens, uh, you know, extinguished the Neanderthals. 
And just to stay in the region, the saga of Gilgamesh is a story of a war between the people of the plains and the people of the mountains. Uh, because uh, when Gilgamesh goes to the cedar forest, he goes to Lebanon, finding trees that had been, you know, had disappeared from, <laughs> from the plains. And, and on and on, the Mahabharata, again, it's a story of a war between, you know, uh, all linked to uh, climate change. So, you know, with something that is not really old. We have to understand that, otherwise we think it's where it's a new thing. <clears throat> we have to learn also from the past. And most of the <clears throat> civilization collapses that we have seen in the history are linked to that. Roman Empire collapsed because of that. So even the great European expansion in the world in the 19th, 20th century is linked to climate change. We had the, you know, a cold period you know, in Europe that pushed people out. So let's see, this is, now, way, wh how this can, you know, we have to deal with this is, uh, is something that is actually to look at m modern things. Because in the past 100 years, we didn't have these problems, and there was no climate uh, tragedy in the past 100 years. And now we are going into the, the new, a new, a new phase. And the issue is essentially one, it's the vulnerability. Talk about heritage now, vulnerability of heritage. You know, the, mm, this issue of uh, vulnerability is not just for heritage, and in, in fact, those who deal mostly with this issue are the military. The military are the ones that study climate change more than anybody else. We, we haven't done it yet. Uh, heritage people have not studied yet climate and heritage impacts, especially in, in connection with conflicts. But if you look at the models that the military do, it's very interesting, because we should do the same thing. Uh, there is a model done by the uh, US Department of Defense. It's called ACTOR which reads analysis of complex threats for operation and readiness, okay? This model looks at where is the potential for conflicts in, uh, linked to climate change. Uh, you know, some of them are in also not far from here, you know? and, and there could be, there could be impacts, uh, <coughs> important impacts linked to sea level rise, desertification, you know, lack of resources, water, water is a, is a big issue. Uh, we haven't done it yet. I think <clears throat> perhaps if, if I can offer Valérie's suggestion, or, this is an area that we should explore more. We should develop a similar model, um, a model that looks at you know, vulnerability of heritage linked to this connection between climate change and conflicts. It's possible because you know, we know already what are the predicted impacts of, of climate heritage, or climate uh, changes in the coming centuries and so on. Um, I, I think it could be very interesting, and maybe we could do it as a consortium of, of, of actors, uh, to, to develop a model that looks at the potential risks. You know, because then we can prevent, we can sort of, you know, or, or at least give directions. So. Uh, as for the region, the region is, uh, is vulnerable. You have processes linked to sea level rise that might threaten places like Bahrain or here. Uh, you have processes like desertification. You know, there is desertification of the desert. It's, it's, a, it's an effect of climate change, because desert is a desert, but it has water. Desertification of the desert means that you have no water in the desert. So things like that, we have to take the facts. I think uh, uh, Andrew has studied more than, than, than anybody else, you know, these things. Uh, take the facts, take the connection with the potential conflicts and link to short-term disasters are short-term, and long-term impacts, migrations and other mobility uh, in, induced by, by, by climate change. And let's you know, identify where, um, where we need to do prevention. You know? um, because I always think in terms of acronym, I have, have actually uh, the acronym for this model. It's called Advanced Long-Term Identification for the Protection of Heritage, and it reads ALIF. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the, the suggestion itself is quite complex. There are many parts that come into play to, uh, um, uh, you know, help look at or impede, you know, look at, uh, you know, mitigating, um, you know, the, the effects of climate change and, and conflict. Um, but in itself, there are things that might impede them. Right, even even preventative uh, measures, you know, and um, you know when 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 should how can we anticipate, you know, uh, uh, you know a crisis that hasn't happened yet, perhaps, or anticipate uh, to what uh, degree or length um, climate change, you know, it's it's um, it's 
it's kind of it's wave or kind of effect all the time because it's a it it, it, it um, <coughs> so what are the but triggers look, out there that we can have to look, get us have, working uh, early we have a standard model in uh, in uh, in this in this field it's made on the on three elements prevention response recovery okay but this is becoming also under you know some kind of discussion because you know we live in in processes that are long term long term climate change long term is conflicts are long term i mean we were used to think of conflicts like a blitzkrieg something that happens in the last four months no it lasts for years decades so you know these three elements somehow have to uh, somehow overlap now so i think prevention is certainly an important uh, thing and perhaps the most difficult one because you have you know you can't you can't prevent everything you know <laughs> and also it's very expensive some countries don't have the resources uh, uh, you may be wrong in where to prevent <laughs> and so on. Response, response is, uh, you know, something that in my view and in my experience, it was the one that was lacking uh, before. Now Alif has put a little bit of a response on, to the response, um, but it's certainly the one that we have to invest more. And I don't think enough has been done. And, and really, this is something that goes to the heart of many international um, treaties and so on. We have a treaty for this, it's the 1954 Convention for the Protection of Cultural Heritage in Case of Conflict. It's a 19th century uh, treaty. <laughs> Somehow, you know, it's been totally ineffective in this, uh, in this recent conflicts. I, I'm, I'm afraid to, <laughs> to, 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 to say so because I would love to have a <laughs> you know, treaty that works, but it didn't work. I mean, think about all the conflicts that happened in the past 20 years. Where, where has the 1954 Convention uh, operated? And <clears throat> so perhaps we have to change our mind and become more pragmatic, which is an, another feature of uh, Alif, and look at where we have to invest in response. I think there are two elements. This has been said already, I'm not inventing anything. Uh, we have to work with the military, <laughs> for sure. It's been done by UNESCO and by many other institutions, but there's more that can be done because this works. You know, the, uh, and we have to work with the other uh, operator that goes into a conflict when everybody goes out, which is the humanitarian, the Red Cross, or the Cross is in Geneva, so it's very easy to reach. I mean, to have, in fact, you know, to equip these two actors, which are not equipped mm -hmm. to protect uh, cultural heritage, to equip them in terms yes. of capacity, skills, and finance to uh, do protection during the, the conflict. And then, of course, response is uh, the long term, and uh, we have it. But uh, all of this will be made more complicated by this uh, conjunction of climate change and conflicts, as, uh, as, as you probably know already. Thank you. Andrew, um, help us unpack you know, the, um, um, uh, the challenge of uh, climate change. It's, it's, you mentioned earlier, in our, uh, when we first opened the session, it is now at the forefront in conversations uh, when it comes to uh, you know, cultural heritage, but, but beyond. Um, could you delve a bit, little bit deeper, please, and explain and expound on, you know, the um, the impact of um, culture, um, climate change, on cultural heritage, and whether there is a correlation, a direct correlation between it and um, the 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 effects, uh, what you know, on cultural heritage. Okay, it, it's a big question. Please, um, all yours. I mean, the, the, I think the first thing that we have to just start by acknowledging uh, is that current climate planning and policy is failing, failing. The, this is not my characterization. This is what Secretary General Guterres said, failing to keep 1.5 alive and failing to deliver transformative climate adaptation to most places. So why? I mean, what hasn't been tried? The world has been trying to address climate change for at least 30 years since the Rio summit. And there is an increasing critique that one of the reasons why climate planning and climate policy is failing is because it has failed to take on board the cultural and social dimensions of the climate crisis and the socio-cultural enabling conditions of climate action. And so this conversation that we're having about culture and climate change is not a peripheral conversation, it's an existential conversation conversation. Yes, we need to take on board the imperatives of the climate crisis in the practice of cultural heritage protection, but climate science and climate policy has to take us on board and has to come to grips with the cultural dimension. So um, that's the first thing to say, and, and one small, not small, but one uh, ancillary point I want to say about this. There is an absolute correlation between the amount we warm the planet and the amount of cultural heritage that is destroyed by climate hazards. 
a direct relationship. And so that's why in 2007, in the UNESCO World Heritage Policy on Climate Change, it calls for a precautionary approach to holding global warming to 1.5 degrees as a strategy for safeguarding cultural heritage. And I don't think any organization can say that it is focused on cultural heritage safeguarding in the climate change context unless it makes a bold statement about the need to mitigate greenhouse gases, get to net zero, and hold global warming to 1.5. And I put that on the table for a leaf to consider. But to answer the last part of your question about then the correlation to conflict, uh, this is very interesting because if you look at the evidence base, if you look at the science of climate change, it's quite messy about the correlation between climate hazards and conflict. Uh, it, the, the IPCC, the, the Climate Science Report in the AR6 cycle from last year, has a very weak statement about the causality between climate impacts and conflict, uh, and the data is just messy. And if you look behind that, the answer seems to be that it's just hard to generalize. If you take uh, any given uh, climate hazard, that hazard results in conflict in some places, and it results in solidarity and cooperation in other places. And what accounts for this differential? And the, what accounts for the differential is different social and economic and political systems in which people are experiencing these phenomenon. And so uh, it's hard to generalize, but at the same time, what that really argues for is people like you all and people like Alif being at the table. If you can't understand the intersection of climate and uh, conflict without understanding the cultural context in which it's occurring, then I would think that argues for having local traditional knowledge carriers, culture advocates, climate experts at the table in climate policy and planning. And so uh, I think th there's a very clear case for, for this intervention to be happening. And Andrew, Andrew you've worked with teams on the ground to um, and, um, support the argument that you are presenting here. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you just a very quick example. Uh, so the, the Climate Heritage Network is a, is a membership-driven organization, so it's really our member organizations around the world that are taking forward projects. There's a lot of interest among our membership in the topic of climate vulnerability assessment. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to marry climate vulnerability assessment, risk assessment, climate adaptation planning with heritage site administration and heritage planning. Uh, and that includes in the conflict context. And so there was an interest among some of our members to look at, can you apply existing climate vulnerability assessment methodologies to heritage site that is also experiencing conflict? Mm -hmm. And some of our members in Nigeria volunteered to take the lead on that. We uh, secured some funding from the UK government and this was done at the Sukur Cultural Landscape in Nigeria, um, near the Nigeria-Cameroon border, which is on the front lines of climate impacts like desertification, but uh, also in the wake of the Boko Haram insurgency. And so they downscaled climate models, they tried to apply climate hazards, uh, determine the impacts on both the attributes and the values of this World Heritage Landscape, but then take account of the um, conflict dimension as well and see if they could uh, assess vulnerability. And what proved to be the case was that it was just incredibly difficult. It was difficult to take on board cascading, compounding risk factors like conflict and also very closely related uh, migration and displacement and determine the trajectory of impacts on the heritage and what adaptation measures should be taken. And I, I guess that's not a, a particularly sexy uh, um, revelation to share with you, but what it did very strongly reinforce is an ethic that we have at the CHN, which is that we in culture can't and shouldn't try to solve, figure out climate change in a culture silo. We, we really need to embed ourselves in the broader world of climate policy and climate science. And I, I would say this to anybody uh, who is contemplating work in this area. Um, we, we need to embed ourselves in existing climate policy and climate science work, and as I alluded to earlier, th they need us also. Thank you for that, Andrew. Um, so, Thierry. So, um, Thierry, I, mean, I think um, where, where Andrew kind of ended, we can, we can um, perhaps look at, you, you work on the ground again, you know, you and, and your team as well, and um, how much of that kind of knowledge in terms of measuring the, 
the impact of climate change on heritage is done by those, by those teams or your team and shared up to policy level. Um, could you perhaps walk us through a couple of examples or your experiences on how effective or ineffective um, or what might be missing that uh, could help perhaps improve uh, this um, uh, you know, communication? Thank you. Uh, merci. Est-ce qu est que je peux avoir la, la présentation? Uh, thank you. Uh, can I have my uh, presentation displayed? Um, uh, the impact of uh, climate change uh, on the conservation of uh, heritage is, uh, uh, it is, is it's a fact that uh, uh, even if the ch climate change uh, climate change is not a new uh, theme uh, of this discussion uh, but as i know there's there's no like concrete uh, cases but um, but when we are on the on the on the field in the field we have we can see many the pressures being um, being placed due to the uh, climate to climate change uh, if, if, when we can see a lot of uh, evidences to, due to that, my, speci my speciality is the architecture of, uh, of soil, of the ground. And uh, uh, so I would like to, to mention about two risks, which are the inundation and the uh, earthquakes. Um, uh, we are witnessing uh, more earthquakes. Uh, we, have, uh, we, have, we are inundation or, or flooding are, um, are attacking or are hitting more areas that we have thought are uh, are desert are deserts or uh, so this is why I would like to um, elaborate further on this point. Uh, this uh, this repetition of violent and uh, and strong um, phenomena uh, and their effect on the on the conservation of nature. We have uh, 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 threats that are becoming more intense than they used to be during this last two years. Uh, and as about. Uh, I will I will talk about two case uh, two uh, study cases. The first one uh, about a, a monument in Saqqara in uh, in Egypt, uh, which has aged to more than four four thousand years. It has been affected as well as the Cairo city um, by um, by. Uh, Quatorze, quinze et le seize du mois de février par des des séismes, euh, euh, excusez-moi, par, par des, euh, des chutes de de, de pluie de torrentielle. Donc, euh, pour, pour l'absorption, la, le, le taux d'absorption du, du terrain euh, est, est déjà limité. Donc, c'est pourquoi euh, les choses on se sont euh, tournées en, en, en des conditions dramatiques. Voilà des, des Des, une sélection d'images, des, des, des descriptions et euh, aussi se trouve dans cette nécropole. Well, that the uh, the, the 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 conditions that, that has transformed in this uh, this uh, ne necropolis. So we have uh, used many techniques many techniques in the in the past, but these uh, techniques are not working anymore. Uh, as a uh, as a um, re response to that, we have used many techniques in in in, in Sudan and as well. So we proposed many actions uh, uh, related. Uh, which are simple to to some uh, the the architecture of the terrain uh, that uh, um, has allowed us to to travel uh, to work on the on the uh, uh, in order to create some kind of um, of um, a, a shelter or a, a top of uh, uh, f on top of the of these monuments in order to to collect water and to to be able to um, 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 alleviate the 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 torrent the 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 monument. Also, we have improved the equipment that we are in use uh, uh, in certain 
certain cases it, it was difficult to to maintain regularly uh, uh, these monuments. Uh, this is why we have made, done many trials sorry, on the use of the equipments on the lower part of the walls so they can subsist or uh, to the uh, uh, climatic uh, effects. And so in Pakistan as well, um, when I was uh, called on to 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 carry out uh, to carry out a mission uh, by by the UNESCO after after uh, flooding uh, that has affected all the uh, all the Pakistan in 2022, uh, and uh, similarly to all the other parts of the region, um, in 10 years, uh, two, 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 the two times the, the annual rate of uh, of uh, of floods or, or of uh, uh, of rains and uh, which is phenomenal for this uh, region uh, and the, the, so uh, and this is the, the, the this is one of the uh, uh, cities that dates back to 4000 years old and uh, and um, and this is why we have to act it uh, uh, quickly uh, as well other uh, catastrophes happening or uh, in in some sites where the um, dom the damage has been uh, massive and uh, um, and we ca we can say that uh, uh, everything has been included in this uh, in the da in this damage by this damage and uh, as we can see here the uh, some uh, photos we needed to to pump out uh, the uh, the water rain water and uh, we they had the the uh, the um, the citizens needed to to use all the what they can in their hands to to fight the the floods so this site has been uh, at the has received out of in, uh, attention from the organ from organization who have uh, have carried out um, a, a great works uh, and we can see that um, a, well, a program has been launched by the UNESCO uh, in cooperation with the with the U United Nations as well with the government of Pakistan. Where the, and many um, uh, projects have been been uh, carried out in terms of uh, conservation and done the in conditions that uh, were. Uh, um, overwhelmed or um, or uh, palliated. So, what were the, in these cases? What should have been? Done, what should have been done? Um, we need to do all the things that we know. We know that they are effective, but uh, uh, we need as well to uh, to launch a program of uh, three years uh, that we have started in Tombouctou. Um, that we that goes in uh, uh, in uh, beyond uh, the uh, traditional equipments by uh, to um, use more technology and uh, uh, and to uh, rethink some of the techniques that uh, of conservation that has been uh, uh, in use so far and which needed uh, to be um, uh, refined um, and uh, as well we needed to test we to evaluate to evaluate um, about because, uh, because in Pakistan we have a group of a a, a team of a work team a team that is working there but we needed to um, to increase their capacities and uh, to give them more uh, resources so they can uh, and we need to as well to try to, uh, to understand all what is happening there, then the, the, so um, we needed further action on these points, m m better, uh, better understanding, not to co to co to construct uh, uh, this uh, or to restore uh, uh, very quickly. Uh, so these are uh, some points that we need uh, to think about and uh, and to uh, revisit the 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 the, uh, the the tools and the methods that we used to used to to. Uh, to uh, to apply, um, um, uh, we don't need to change a lot, but we need to add add them, and so they can uh, and to uh, think more about the management side, and uh, and uh, so we need to, to think uh, of the technical side and the management side as well. This is in brief and as a, t as a testimony of uh, uh, of what we have experienced, and uh, and uh, maybe we have further. Uh, uh, suggestions that I will share them uh, later, but uh, uh, my organization works more in uh, 
dans l'étape après le conflit ou, euh, ou le désastre. Euh, il n'y a Uh, we don't say that there is a um, um, natural disasters. We have uh, um, natural events, but the way that we prepare or get ready for them uh, um, uh, in order to reach uh, the, the, uh, that, so that would make the difference in reaching that, that and how we reach that crisis and how we approach it. We need to be prepared for uh, such uh, for events that are exceptional uh, like this, and there will always be exceptional uh, uh, incidents. Uh, we need to know where they hit and we need to know how we should be prepared. Like in France, um, we uh, a flood happened and only one bridge that has um, has uh, uh, stayed uh, standing. Uh, uh, and we, and the uh, and th that uh, bridge was was built in uh, 20, in 2021. So we need to rethink all these things that we apply the actions or and and. and we need to use um, and to not to build our concept on the on the on the on the tools that we are using but we need to to uh, to check out the the temperature the effect of uh, of change of uh, climatic change and, and it's very important to prompt tous les conditions uh, in order we need to plan, to take into consideration all these uh, elements on, um Est-ce que ce sera plus euh, effectif euh, en, en répondant à, ces, à votre euh, appel, peut-être d'avoir plus de, de soutien et plus de ressources, et si, si l'approche était différente ou les systèmes étaient différents et, euh, alors, les deux cas que je vous ai présentés ne sont pas dans des zones de... de les, 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 uh, the cases that, happen, that I already mentioned uh, doesn't happen necessarily in, in, uh, in areas of conflict, but they can uh, take place in other as well areas. Some, um, um, uh, some uh, um, incidents can happen in, in other areas, and, uh, and this makes things more complex, the preparation, the, uh, uh, the getting readiness, so, and the way that to, to implement uh, the, these actions can become more dramatic. So, uh, the uh, how to force foresee um, the and uh, to uh, and how to foresee all this and the prevention measures and prevention actions as well. We need to, and the community uh, who are responsible or, or taking in enhance the conservation and needs to be um, uh, to to sensibilize our, uh, about it. We need to uh, to uh, to make more. Uh, uh, to bring together the 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 the, uh, uh, the the equipments and the tools that needs to uh, to foresee the happening of any any incidents in order to be able to prevent them from happening or to be able to be prepared for facing them in more e uh, effective and efficient way. You talked about you've been reporting on on this issue and observing uh, over time perhaps how things have changed in one way or another. Um, what are what are your um, uh, you know deductions perhaps um, on that scene? Um, well, one thing I just want to pick up on what Andrew and Thierry were saying. Uh, uh, that the question of the causation between climate change and cultural heritage disaster is something that is um, you know messy and complex, as you say. W one of the things that's clear, one of the things that's clear, is that. Climate change is a driver of economic crises. And these economic crises become a force multiplier when we're trying to help climate change. So for example, if we think of Agadez, we have the representative from Agadez in the audience today. Um, you know, these mud brick techniques of, of shoring up and kind of renewing the walls of the mud brick mausoleums and mosques and houses, um, the people who have the, that knowledge, that cultural knowledge, they are fleeing Niger because they have to, you know, um, there's no job prospects, there's conflict, you know, it's an unstable place to be. And they're taking with them that indigenous knowledge, that ancestral cultural knowledge, and they're going, you know, they're going to Canada, they're going to the US. So that means that part of the work, as we saw in the presentation of Aleph, is not, is not putting the, the mud back on the mud brick, but teaching a whole new generation of people because that knowledge has been lost because of the economic crisis, which is itself 
something that came from climate change. So that's, that's the messy and complex way that if we think of you know, the paradigm of prevent and, and restore, you know, climate change is difficult in the prevent, you know, it, it, it hurts in the prevent section <laughs> because we can't prevent it. And then it really hurts in the restore section because it impedes um, our attempts to, you know, bring in that indigenous knowledge that actually is in many ways, as you were saying, in Pakistan, these conservation techniques are the best way um, uh, to restore some of these cultural heritage monuments. So that's, I think that's trying to shoehorn my, my thing into an answer to you. Um, and, and just to that point, Melissa, also it seems there's, um, there's a connection between the bricks and mud with the people mm. when it comes to identity. We've seen that video earlier, you know, the man was heartbroken, obviously, by what, uh, what has happened to his, his town. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, I think someone in the previous panel said it's people, 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 and, and that's what we're learning. And I think, you know, in, in a more direct answer to your question, what I, what I have really seen and what has been most interesting is that, you know, I think, I, I forget who it was, maybe it was even on this panel, my brain is melting. Um, you know, w let's say last century we thought of cultural heritage as archaeological sites, you know, you know, bricks and mortar, really. And then in the early 2000s, we had a shift to intangible cultural heritage, you know, rituals, music, handicrafts. And it was really telling to me that Dr. Westerman on the talk this morning said, can we even distinguish between tangible and intangible cultural heritage? You know, that's so embedded in us in thinking around cultural heritage that we can't, we don't think of them as separate. But there's also a third shift that's happening right now, and that's towards thinking of the biosphere and plants and animals, flora and fauna, as cultural heritage that is worth preserving and is also how we preserve it. So um, I don't know how much time we have. Do we have a couple more minutes. Um, I'll, I'll go we'll, real we'll quick. We'll leave another round for final words, but also um, solutions, perhaps. And I, I know we touched on them, but no, please, Melissa. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll trade my please. solution for this. No, because I wanted to um, raise another, um, oh, mm. talk to you. I guess th the lens we choose to look at the problem, whether consciously or subconsciously, kind of shapes our understanding mm. of you know, what constitutes and defines a cultural heritage. So, um, yeah, exactly. So th I think that's this question of the definition of cultural heritage is changing and it's changing in, in multifaceted ways. So I want to bring up as an example to make this a bit more concrete, um, a project that Alec is supporting in the Swat Valley and it's led by Luca Maria Olivieri. So if he's here, um, this is your project. I'm just repeating it. But what's interesting to me is it's um, a temple complex in the Swat Valley in northern Pakistan. And it's um, uh, temples and administrative buildings that's on top of a hillside. And the hillside is eroding. And the, the, the area which dates to the third century BC was really important because it allowed for double crop cultivation. So you had a crop in the summer and you had a crop in the autumn, which meant that the people of this valley were creating about three times as much grain and as much crops as they needed to feed their own population of about 300,000. So it developed into a major trading center and then it became very wealthy, they built the temple complex and they um, became a, a really important trading post. Now, what is interesting to me about this research is A, that it's bringing in this knowledge of how humans managed the flora and fauna, managed the, the plant crop. So the, the importance of their um, contributions is that they were able to work with the land to have double crop cultivation. So even that you see this understanding of management of the land entering into our, our thought process of what's important to understand about the past. And the second is that how they are conserving this hillside or how they're, you know, they're doing the traditional work to the, to the temple complex, but they're also building, um, they're also planting olive groves on the hillside to stop it from erosion. And they had to find a new, they had to splice together, I think, a, a, an olive tree from Lebanon with, a, with an um, endemic variety to Pakistan to make something a bit more hardy. But that has become a way to stop soil erosion and to create a revenue stream for the, for the people there. So, so you see how the biosphere is a, is a subject that's being investigated, it's being researched, it's also a tool, and it's a way of um, understanding that it's a tool that's living and growing with these people as they can use it as a revenue stream. So it's, so it's not just, um, um, you know, it's not just something that's going on in the background, it's an yeah. active part of preserving cultural heritage and thinking of what cultural heritage is. Yeah, no, Melissa, thank you for sharing that. So it seems the, the, the value of indigenous knowledge in itself, it, it's shaped by the environment over time. 
So there is no one solution that fits all in a sense. And so, so lessons have been learned, you know, uh, we, in a way touching on capacity building as well, but there's always room for improvement. And so for the last few minutes, maybe a minute and a half or two minutes each, um, what kinds of sustainable solutions, solutions. you know, um, solutions. advice uh, you, know, you can from, offer? From my point of view, uh, of course, solutions is complex. Uh, it's a difficult word. But <laughs> let's say there are two actions that we can uh, promote, develop, support. Uh, one has it at the policy level. It's very important. The policy is very important. And in the past 20 years, this has really gone very, very uh, far. We have now uh, the, uh, the strategy for uh, reinforcement of the... Uh, capacity to protect heritage, Alif is part of this uh, <coughs> response, um, many, many new laws and, uh, and, and uh, treaties and, and, and conventions and declarations have come up. Even in the uh, climate change, now this year the World Heritage Convention, which will meet here in the region in, in Saudi Arabia in uh, September, will adopt after 15 years after you, the, the, the previous uh, <coughs> policy, there will be a new policy document, which will be very, very important on climate change. You know, everything has been analyzed, impacts, awareness, uh, uh, responses, and so on. So I think it's, uh, uh, although, uh, unfortunately, half of the discussion that I follow uh, went uh, onto the CBDRRC. Uh, do you know what the CBDRRC is? Yes. Uh, it's the uh, common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capacities issue, which is <laughs> <laughs> member states you know, are care more <laughs> than, than impacts. Anyway, so <laughs> we have to, to swallow this, yes. but that, that's... Uh, but I think the World Heritage will, will actually lead the way to a, a new approach, and this is very, very important. The policy is very important. Yes. Uh, and then we have to look at the action, I mean, the, the implementation, and uh, this is made up of long, complex uh, uh, initiatives, training, uh, uh, response, uh, you know, preparation, uh, risk preparedness, and so on, things that we know already, but they have to be expanded. What's very important, and I close with this, we have to lift up the issue of heritage and, and culture in the international agenda. It's not very high at the moment, but we should lift it up uh, because then it will become an object of bigger policies, SDGs and everything else. Okay, thank you for that. Andrew. Uh, well, we, we are increasingly seeing cultural heritage organizations take on board the imperatives of the climate emergency um, the decision of the European Union to fund a new heritage hub that will have climate change as a transversal focus is an example. The focus on climate change and the World Monuments Fund watch list is an example. Uh, I think it would be very, very valuable mm -hmm. if Alif continued its expansion into this area as well, bringing their ethos of action, action, action. And there's a lot of areas where action is needed, but I want to just conclude by talking about this idea of prevention. Mm -hmm. and of of course, it is difficult for any one organization to prevent climate hazards from happening, although everybody needs to support decarbonization, as I said. But not every climate hazard needs to result in a disaster or in conflict. And I mentioned at the outset, some climate shocks trigger cooperation, some climate, the same climate shock in other places triggers conflict. And what is the differential? And this needs more study, but I think you will find culture, uh, uh, culture and cultural resilience is often uh, behind the scenes in where shocks result in conflict and where they don't. And so what are some dimensions of, of this resilience? When I list them, you'll immediately hear elements of Alif's existing program. So places where diverse knowledge systems are valorized are more resilient. Places where local capacities and local knowledge and local materials are, are uh, effective are more resilient. Yes. And so uh, I guess what I would suggest is that we focus on what are the cultural conditions that prevent climate hazards from resulting in more conflict? And we try to be more intentional about building those elements into our programs and emphasizing that work in what we do. Thank you very much. Thierry, a minute. Je ne sais pas si on peut remettre les, les, les slides. Um, pour moi, cette question de prévention... Cette question de prévention qui est, qui est, qui est très importante, c'est quelque chose qui n'est pas nouveau. Euh, depuis les années 80, on travaille avec Ikrop sur ces questions de conservation préventive et c'est quelque chose qui, moi, m'a beaucoup euh, intéressé parce que c'est aussi une question d'économie et je crois qu'aujourd'hui, on, on parle aussi de changement climatique, c'est aussi une question euh, d'économie, euh, de moyens, économie d'un de, 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 peu tout et si on peut trouver des, des solutions simples et prévenir... 
it involves the actions of uh, the economy of uh, uh, in many ways and and it's still a problem in the in the uh, word of conservation uh, and we, we uh, to which we can uh, apply the what the uh, the uh, what is uh, before the conflict and what is after the conflict and in uh, in uh, on, uh, Baku, in in Mali we have already as in the summit that has been held there we have discussed the the, the about the prevention and we have uh, uh, talked about uh, mis uh, put the ac accent on the importance of uh, the follow up and the uh, tracking um, uh, actions that we that we need to ensure and uh, when we talk about the changing climate changing it is very important be because we have uh, challenges that are uh, extreme sometimes and uh, and what we need to do is uh, is to understand further the, the consequences and the procedures to that we need to act upon in in order to to and we need to put on the table more fast recommendations that goes in pair with the evolution of these uh, challenges and these uh, threats and uh, the quantification and the qualification is very important in uh, on this at uh, this level uh, as another lesson that as uh, I have learned is that when we have we have distractions in uh, where there is a lot of information that we need to know they uh, we have in Tombuktu the Mosul it's uh, um, uh, uh, helped us learn a lot about what, uh, how, uh, how they were destructed, how, what, what are the actions needed to take. So, so we need to to take these events if they exist as as case studies in order to learn from them, and uh, as well to set the alarm if in case more incidents are to happen. So we need to to, uh, to always keep that in our mind. Uh, in terms of recommendations, I have, uh, and this is not a, like a long list that I would like to uh, to lay out. First, uh, I would say uh, that not only to think about reconstruction, but as, we, as well to take into consideration the threats and to be able to anticipate them, uh, and as well to to, to the, see some dis disorganization as well need, need uh, is needed in some cases, and Pascal as well has talked about the construction um, but uh, are there are other elements like the documentation uh, like the lessons learned uh, the evaluation uh, and as well the criteria and the um, word standards and the ex the, uh, the volume of expertise needed and the equipments and the resources that and the question of uh, financial management in order to be able to sustain this uh, flexibility that we have talked about and as well to be well organized and well managed in order to to be able to work in different conditions and a different context so it is important it's important to to evaluate the projects uh, that are submitted and to um, and to help to make sure that this uh, projects lead to create something more uh, more uh, relevant to the area and more relevant to, to conservation and uh, as well we need to think how uh, how we can help uh, some projects um, um, further. Some some uh, some projects are are under have under capacitated. They don't have the the required level of capacities, and we need they need more. And in terms of uh, financing, as well, um, the 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 the, uh, the idea of flexibility is very important. And I think more. Uh, and I encourage all, um, uh, all of us to just to to think more about about uh, this. And what is I find more interesting is uh, the all the analysis that are. Um, uh, are made um, and uh, made of the project out of these projects. We need to maybe we to launch more projects that are more analysis, more dedicated and more specialized at, uh, at the uh, analysis and to, and to conduct more research, more st study on the management, the ecology and the structures um, of the uh, of the teams and the, and of the projects themselves. How the and to monitor the progress of these projects and how we need be, be able. 
able to um, to bring in uh, um, a, a training in order to um, uh, in order to consolidate those projects. This is some of the uh, points that I'm thinking about, uh, and we need to think about the the persons involved, the the population that are are um, um, under the effect of of, uh, of these projects. Um, so, and as well to think about uh, at the level of the community and the institutions with some uh, uh, some. Um, some people are some people are uh, in danger in, in this in these areas and as well to we need to take uh, that into consideration uh, the 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 uh, the people are the ones who as who uh, can ensure the longevity of this project and of this uh, of the heritage in uh, at large so and as well the uh, we need to, to to bring more training to the national cadres and and uh, the doc and the documentation it it needs a lot of it requires a lot of uh, efforts to be deployed and uh, um, and when we are when we have documentation we can always return to revisit uh, the uh, these sites so uh, uh, we need to keep on uh, bring uh, bring in all these efforts or putting in these efforts and this is in brief my points of view uh, sit in uh, a kind of uh, approach to it but just maybe a final words uh, Melissa you know is it a communication crisis but otherwise um, uh, you know a few seconds, your yeah, last no. thoughts. And everyone's hungry. <laughs> um, no, I mean, just to echo what everyone was saying, I think, you know, the thing that has surprised me when I started uh, researching climate change in cultural heritage is just every situation is so different. You know, some people are dealing with this, but they have this adequate difficulty of that, and um, there's no one-size-fits-all, and I think that's what we've all been saying. So, I mean, listen to the local knowledge uh, as much as, um, you know, uh, expertise from elsewhere and, and share that knowledge. Um, but, you know, I, I think Andrew's point is, is, is a major one. We have to decarbonize. We have to work on climate change and then on cultural heritage. Unfortunately, I don't know. I don't know what else we can do. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all. A big thank you to the panelists. A big thank you to you for being with us here. Have a great evening. I think we'll... S Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it works. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much for the for the great plenary discussion. Uh, we are about to have our lunch break. Just a couple of short, short, short announcements. There is now a detailed agenda on the screen, but also on the screens outside for the workshops and the majlis and their uh, their associated rooms. Please do re try to remember to take your headsets off and leave them outside this room. You will have access to new ones in the other rooms. And we will, their next plenary session is here tomorrow morning. So this afternoon is workshops and majlis, and then we will go to the evening activities. So thank you very much, everybody, and have a good lunch. Thank you.